¿ok? Ok. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, or good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the fourth FAPESP webinar uh, on uh, open data under the COVID uh, data and data sharing pandemic. Uh, FAPESP is a pioneer in open science practices and in actively funding and promoting open data. And as such, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Luis Eugenio Melo, Scientific Director of FAPESP, and also a big supporter and promoter of these practices. Professor Melo, to you. Thank you, Claudia. I would like uh, to start uh, just uh, stressing the importance uh, of uh, open data and open science, uh, most of all in the current times. As we face uh, a global challenge, uh, it's important uh, for us to uh, amass all of the information that uh, we are able to generate, and from that, to generate evidence uh, that uh, would allow uh, for different uh, communities and countries uh, to uh, uh, better uh, prepare to face this uh, challenge. Uh, it's a, a well-established uh, fact that uh, when uh, COVID-19 uh, hit China, uh, the uh, Wuhan province first, uh, a number of casualties uh, 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 took place. And, and those were, uh, uh, I would say, more aggressive there than uh, in, in subsequent uh, waves and countries that were affected as each country and each community learned from the lessons uh, uh, by the previous uh, 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 harder hit uh, countries. Uh, data, uh, uh, open data and open science, it's uh, 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 not uh, a new uh, endeavor. It is actually uh, as old as uh, myself, as I was uh, reading about it. It started in, in the 1950s as uh, uh, a proposal by uh, geophysicists and geologists and people from uh, that area of knowledge. But uh, we're still uh, uh, grasping and, and, and trying uh, uh, hard effort, making a hard effort for making it uh, uh, a wide uh, uh, and, and, and uh, solid foundation for all uh, uh, fields of science. Uh, we took uh, the uh, opportunity, of course, uh, on, on this uh, pandemic to further promote uh, the need uh, for open science. And this uh, uh, event takes place on the specific uh, moment of the COVID uh, pandemic, but uh, it's intended to bring and open up the discussion for a, a stronger effort uh, on the part of all communities uh, for uh, open data and open science. Uh, I, I would like to thanks uh, to thank a lot uh, uh, all of the invited uh, guests from uh, different countries, uh, which uh, again have uh, already uh, uh, been uh, on this field uh, for a long time, and uh, with uh, whom we hope uh, to uh, make this uh, a better effort. So back to you, Claudia. Thank you very much. And I'd like to take the opportunity to compliment uh, what you've been saying and uh, point out to everybody who's listening to us that uh, FAPESP has launched back in June a pioneer effort on opening up COVID-19 clinical data on hundreds of thousands of Brazilians. And if you want to know more about this effort, please check COVID-19 FAPESP page that has more information on how to access, download, and use you, you, that data and the data that are coming in the future for all kinds of interesting research. Now, I'd just like to point out that today we have a very wonderful panel with lots of exciting information. And uh, this webinar is being recorded 
on a YouTube channel, so it will be available afterwards. And uh, if you want to send questions, please do them by email at any time to live, L-I-V-E, at fapes.br. Our invitees are researchers in a variety of fields, epidemiology, public health, bioinformatics, and social sciences. And I have the honor to start with Professor Mauricio Barreto, who is an emeritus professor at the University, Federal University of Bahia in Brazil, and a senior investigator at Fiocruz, which is a scientific institution, a Brazilian scientific institution for research and development um, in biology and biological issues. And it's considered one of the world's main public health research institutions. He conducts research in epidemiology and collective health, and he's going to talk to us about this initiative he's created and hands, and he's a fellow of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences and the World Academy of, Science, of Sciences, and an honorary professor and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And now I pass to Mauricio. Good morning and thank you for coming, Mauricio. Important event. Yeah. Oh, I, I'd like to thank you to be here in this so important event. I'm sharing my presentation, okay? Are you hearing me? Yes, that's okay. Okay, yes. that's okay. Okay, thank you very much to, to be here, yeah, for this so prestigious invitation, yeah, to be in this seminar with so nice people and with Luis Eugenio, with uh, Claudia. Uh, to say that uh, I'm also would, would like to start to say that the initiative from FAPESP to create a, a database of patients with COVID is a fantastic initiative. Yeah, and uh, uh, as far as it is going to develop, there will be a, really a very important resource to study COVID in Brazil and worldwide. Uh, my talk uh, in my 15 minutes that I have, I'm going to, to start to talk about an experience that is going on in Salvador, yeah, and then uh, go a bit on COVID, yeah, how this move to help in the COVID yeah, initiatives. Yeah, as you know, health data, I'm a, a, an epidemiologist and a public health epidemiologist. And the, in general, interested to question related to population health. Yeah, and uh, health data now is a very complex matter now nah? because it, there is a different source of data, yeah, different types of data. Yeah, and also as health is connected with different yeah, contacts, different factors. Yeah, okay, the health data at the end is everything that exists in the world have some connection with the health. Then this create a broad field, yeah, to, to, to and uh, a big responsibility of those that work in this with data, health data, now yeah, who define what it is, yeah, and how to collect, assemble these and put it in a way, yeah, uh, that it contributes to, to the development of the knowledge yeah, and then to contribute to research, yeah, uh, on different aspects of health. Yeah, there, there is an idea that the, this existing data uh, is so large and so uh, in different yeah, types, but also they are spread uh, on different databases, yeah, on different uh, places, on different institutions, yeah, on different types of data. Yeah. Then if we put these, all these data together, uh, you create a huge, uh, a capacity yeah, to understand what's happened yeah, with each, each of us yeah, and uh, to co contribute to the development of research. Yeah? This is very clear this, yeah, that the data that each one of us collected 
né? A, a, a data that if it is put together is a huge yeah, asset in terms of a, of a, of a recession development. Yeah, but there is a, a lot of challenge to do that. Yeah, it's not easy challenges. Yeah, and a very difficult task. Yeah, no, it's not simple. Yeah, data heterogeneity, fragmentation, the availability of some types of data. Yeah, the management of the data. Yeah, access. And one question that is very central that is the privacy aspect. Yeah, when you talk with it, individual data, yeah, you have a lot of privacy uh, concerns, yeah, and these are uh, uh, go beyond the ethical aspects and go to the area of legal aspects, yeah, the, the different countries have legal frames to, to, to justify or to uh, administer yeah, the way people uh, use this data. Then this is a really a big challenge, yeah, and the, this on, on international area is complicated because different countries have different legislation, yeah, different rules, how to work with this data. Then this creates a lot of problems, yeah, in terms of the connection, yeah, and possibilities of data exchange, yeah, and movement of data, yeah, of personal data. Uh, in European, there is some European here, yeah, you, ha you have the general data protection regulation that have been a very uh, special frame, yeah, and it's uh, been used to inspire on uh, different uh, societies, yeah, not only in Europe, but worldwide, yeah, there is a reference nowadays in terms of thinking on data, yeah, on personal data regulation. In Brazil, you have yeah, a bit inspired in the GDPR, you have the a law on treatment and protection of personal data that was approved, yeah, and in, at, at the end in 2019, and will be in action yeah, next year. Yeah, the, the law was approved, but it is in a, a period yeah, of adaptation and it created the, the uh, infralegal uh, structure, yeah, and the, it's expected the law came yeah, in action next year. But yeah, what I would like to, in this context, what I'd like to talk a bit uh, is about CIDAC. CIDAC is an initiative yeah, that the, we are developing here in Salvador, sorry. Uh, the details of CIDAC, some details are published in this paper, then I'm going to do a very small summary yeah, what CIDAC. CIDAC is an infrastructure yeah, that involves uh, uh, a lot of different things, but uh, safety, a uh, safety environment, yeah, very safety environment to protect the data, yeah, uh, personal identified data, yeah. You work together with another center here in Salvador that you have a supercomputer center that gives some uh, computer support to the center, yeah, and then and involve a lot of different uh, a team of different people, yeah, working computer but a lot of them are working specific research topics, yeah, and using this data, yeah, to answer question, yeah, like a big experiment, yeah, what uh, you try is a CD experiment, yeah, to develop the concept of using the big national uh, Brazilian databases, yeah, to produce uh, knowledge, yeah. In, in health field, you have a, a, a big issue, yeah, there are several, but you have a big issue that the, the question of great part of the research are very good in terms of methods, yeah. They have a very strong internal validity, but very few uh, capacity of generalization. Okay. You think that with this kind of data, using large data sets, yeah, you lost a bit uh, of the internal validity, yeah. But you keep some and the strongest sufficient to, to, to be valid the research. But you 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 have a new possibilities in terms of the generability of the results. Then this is an important point that I'd like to to put uh, to discussion maybe. Uh, the the CDAC have a, a data concept, a yeah, data platform that is a, a conceptual frame. Yeah, around that uh, conceptual frame that you are developing our resources. Yeah, you have three years. Yeah, it's a relatively young uh, experience. Yeah, then you are developing yeah, our platform using this concept that uh, 
here uh, this design yeah summarizes the concept yeah the, which is a transversal the element that yeah security privacy and the ethics ethics and with three levels yeah data production data creation and data access yeah some of these levels are well developed the others are in in process of development like for example the data access component that you have some elements but are in process of development to have an idea now a cdax you have a, a, a contract with some of the brazilian government ministries and you house in cdax yeah some of the brazilian database identified databases yeah and you see a uh, huge numbers yeah you have uh, one of the big database in brazil on the, the the half more than half of the brazilian population that the cadastro unico have 140 million people yeah, you have it, uh, a lot of different social programs yeah one of the interests of cdax is to test the effect of the social protection programs on health yeah then you have uh, the, the citizenship uh, ministry and the, the city ministry, you have a different program that they develop and they send, they put in CDAX in some of this data, yeah. And you have the uh, health data, yeah, that is supplied by the data suits, the Ministry of Health, yeah. The, for example, the debt registration in Brazil for several years, this go uh, around 20 million records. Yeah, the birth registrar, which near, yeah, because some of these have been updated, yeah, near 50 million registra registers. And then different things, yeah, infection diseases, yeah, hospitalization data, etc. And you're developing a lot because you're central in the system is the linkage of this database, yeah. Uh, not all these 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 data are uh, heavy a uh, common number yeah like in some countries have a common number you know the databases then become very easy to connect yeah so in brazil some of the databases have common numbers but others do not have then you know you don't you need to use the identifiers like name or mother names age date of birth and the others yeah to connect that then you you need the uh, more computational results. This is a big issue, you know, in our system, yeah. And development of a quick uh, software to do this linkage, yeah. Given that this probabilistic linkage are uh, very much uh, computer consuming, yeah. Uh, uh, it's in, in particular, when you talk about the uh, database with, with uh, over 100 million, yeah, to link 100 million with 40 million, this create a huge, a challenge né? and then you try to you are not efforts to developing software that are, have, have been quicker né? and they have been optimizing yeah all the the possibility to make it more efficient the system you uh, have a lot of consideration for safety linkage and create the safety data linkage environment yeah uh, a, a reference is a this paper that you know, as a group, an international group that the design or put together some of this concept, yeah, that are uh, in general acceptable internationally, yeah, because they involve in several stages in this, uh, the, 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 all the system, yeah, data access approvals, yeah, the different approvals for the data to be CDAX, to use the data, where to use, and things like that. Uh, using uh, a lot of requirement from the researcher that plan to use uh, data. Uh, and uh, the physical and virtual setting, yeah, that you need to be also offered uh, a lot of uh, condition uh, to keep the data as safe as possible. Uh. And for example, all the, the center, uh, or the, the core of the center where these data are, a, a house, yeah, on the identified data house, yeah, completely disconnected from internet, yeah, they are not uh, that you have any connection with internet, yeah, then to uh, give you a virtual protection of the data, yeah, and there is other physical arrangements to the data to be well protected, yeah, and to keep it you know, on a really safe environment.
yeah, I'm going to talk briefly on two of our initiatives, yeah, the 100 million Brazilian cohort and the CDAX girls cohort. The, the concept in the center is not to use on the data separated, but integrate this data in big infrastructure, yeah. And two of these infrastructure, there is others in development, is the 100 million Brazilian cohort and the CDAX birth cohort. Then 100 million Brazilian cohort is a structure that now involves over 100 million people. In fact, now we have 140 million, yeah. That a lot of different databases have been linked yeah, all together and in an articulated way. And then now it's possible to explore, yeah, like a big cohort, yeah, to explore different questions, yeah, on, on this cohort. And then there is uh, at least now uh, around 30 projects, yeah, that are using aspect of this, of this uh, data from this cohort, yeah, to do specific analysis and to test specific question. Some, yeah, start to be published, yeah, as I said, it's back like three years, then the publication now is coming, yeah, the beginning of this year, especially end of past year and beginning of this year, start to come some of our publications, yeah, and some uh, evaluating, yeah, and uh, very original studies and with very large yeah, capacity of generalization of the results. Here are some, yeah, ideas. I'm going to some examples of other projects that are in course, yeah. Uh, uh, the CIDAX birth cohort yeah, is another initiative that involves, uh, after join yeah, some of this data, you have a baseline with uh, near 25 million births. Yeah? And you explore, uh, connect it also this, yeah, like a big birth cohort uh, to uh, answer question like this. Uh, for example, the effect of cesarean section on marginal and child outcomes. And, uh, a huge analysis uh, has been completed now and show uh, if in very clear way how cesarean section uh, increases the, the, the mortality uh, or the, the, the chance of survival of children uh, up to five years of age. And that would be a very important result and uh, example of the, the potential of this, of this data. Uh. When come COVID, you start to think on specific. Né? COVID was is a so big issue that you try to use this infrastructure né? Uh, to to think on COVID. Né? And here, very briefly, né? Uh, you have different data on COVID. Yeah, and COVID complex is a disease. It's complex, like any specific disease. Né? And you have a lot of different systems that inform on COVID, yeah. And it, all these data need to be put together, yeah, in an articulated way. Né? You have a data that are in public domain. You have it. There's they identified identified data. You have identified data that need to be protected. You have open data, and you have the laws, the normative actors yeah, around the a COVID-19, yeah, for example, the social distancing, yeah, in general, uh, law in the act. Then you try to, to, to put together all the possibility of data that exists in Brazil, né? in special, né? in Bahia and the Northeast region, but in Brazil in general, yeah. And there is different data sources, yeah. And you, there is challenge to do that and to develop that is yet in process of development, yeah. Uh, to to get individual data, you need a lot of ethical approvals and the approvals and the uh, authorities approval, uh, signatures, yeah, and guarantees that you are going to protect this data, yeah. A lot of the problem is the interoperability uh, among system, yeah, to put this data all together, yeah. Brazil have a huge uh, system is in development, but not everything uh, integrated, you know, and then part of the Air Force is integrated this data. Uh, then the same problem in general to integrate data. And then you are uh, trying to uh, show uh, some use, some of these efforts have been uh, have concrete results, yeah, and have been a uh, uh, efforts that generate yeah, in some way information, knowledge yeah, to, 
to the society, uh, the Brazilian society, and the only to summarize here, my time is finished, yeah, with this data, you keep a, a dashboard, yeah, is one of the Brazilian dashboards on, on COVID, yeah, with very detailed uh, data at municipal level, yeah, and with some capacity of it, not only to, to show data, but only to project yeah, cases, yeah, the, it has a, 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 a internal system that it make it estimation, yeah, and projection, I use, yeah, a modeling yeah, algorithm, yeah, to project the data, yeah, then is a, is very much used nowadays, yeah, very assessed for different organizations, the public, the press, yeah, to, to see case around the country, yeah. A mathematical modeling, yeah, there is a group here, yeah, in the other group, but a group here in Bahia that is using uh, this data to mathematical modeling, yeah, that have been very important here yeah, to, to prediction, to estimation of, of resource capacity, and the other use, yeah, and these databases have been very important you know, to, to the group to, to explore and extract the basic data you know, to perform the and the updated the model, the, the models, yeah. Uh, several epidemiological study, yeah. For example, recently uh, uh, there is several example here. An example, yeah. Uh, there, there is a, a question on obesity and the and the COVID, yeah. And using the Brazilian data was possible to a quick exploration, yeah, to see that your obesity have an independent role, yeah, as a risky as a comorbidity uh, and increases the risk of severe COVID outcomes. Uh, independent of the, the guy or the, the, the person heavy uh, cardiovascular or diabetes, but only obesity is, is uh, it, this was possible given the big number that is already assembled in this database. Uh, for example, in this study was used over 20,000 uh, case of COVID all over Brazil nah, and registered all over Brazil. And then it was possible to do a very refined analysis yeah, on the role of obesity uh, using data that is already available. And the several reports, yeah, uh, different groups have used the data to do report. This is a example of analysis of the pandemic in the Northeast region of Brazil. Yeah, using the, the data, and a great part of the data was uh, come from this uh, database. Okay, thank you very much. I'm finishing. I think. Uh, yeah, you have, to... you have to turn your camera and microphone off. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This was a wonderful introduction to the rest of our uh... Claudia, you are muted, please. Unmute your microphone, please. I know, thank you, I'm so sorry. Now I'm unmuted, right? This yes. always happens to me, I'm so sorry. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Anne Cambon Thompson, uh, who is a French medical doctor specialized in human immunogenetics and health ethics. And she's an emeritus research director at CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research. And she works in an epidemiology and public health unit at the Université Toulouse 3 and in CIRM, which is the French National Health Research Institute. Um, she is an ambassador of the Research Lead Alliance and has been a co-chair of the RDA COVID-19 working group of RDA. And this is what she's going to introduce to us. And thank you so much for coming to talk to us. It's now I pass it on to you. Thank you very much and hello to, to all. Uh, I try to share my screen. Is it working? I guess. Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much for um, having me uh, among these uh, 
panel members and I'm uh, happy to uh, share the experience uh, of the Research Data Alliance COVID-19 Working Group that has worked from end of March to end of June and it's continuing on a lower basis right now. And uh, if you want to hear more about the ethical aspects or the French initiatives or French uh, data on COVID, that can come in the discussion later on. So first of all, I, I will take this uh, working group as an example regarding the organization of international cooperation around COVID-19 data. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Anne. Maybe yes? you might want to show the slides via your uh, slideshow uh, facility. Okay, uh, it should work. Yeah, let me see. Ah, is this better? Yes, this is much better. Thank you so <laughs> okay. much. Sorry for for uh, for this. Um, so, as an example of this uh, uh, cooperation, this is the outline of the presentation. I will first explain briefly what is RDA, uh, and then we will go through this experience of this working group and what it has been doing. So, RDA, the Research Data Alliance, uh, is an international uh, um, organization. Uh, that has the vision that uh, researchers and innovators uh, should openly share and reuse data. And this is across technologies, disciplines and countries, and that is related to the grand challenges of society. And its mission is to uh, build uh, social and technical bridges that enable or facilitate uh, open sharing and reuse of data whenever it's uh, possible. So it works through different uh, groups, uh, interest groups or working groups. There are 98 uh, of them currently. And it uh, uh, produces uh, uh, recommendations, standards, uh, different kind of uh, outputs. Uh, and uh, it uh, assembles for the moment uh, nearly 11 thousand individual, uh, individuals from uh, 145 countries. And they are from mainly from academia and research, but also from public administrations and for enterprise and uh, uh, industry uh, world. There are also organizational members and affiliate members. So it's under this um, uh, this um, overarching frame uh, that a working group uh, has been dedicated uh, using the RDA infrastructure to RDA uh, uh, COVID-19. It's an RDA community response to uh, the challenge of COVID-19 and it has produced recommendations and guidelines that as usual in uh, uh, RDA are uh, by the community and for the community or the communities. So I, I want to explain how it is both a classical working group and an exceptional one. Uh, it's classical in the terms of that it has objectives um, and uh, to produce recommendations and guidelines to help uh, researchers and data stewards uh, to follow best practice in order to maximize the efficiency of the work and to act as a sort of a blueprint for future emergencies, if not restricting itself to COVID-19. Uh, also, another objective was to, re to produce recommendations to help policymakers and funders, not only the researchers themselves, to maximize timely and quality data sharing in such case of health emergencies and to address interest of researchers, policymakers, funders and also publishers and providers of data sharing infrastructures. And you just heard from Mauricio how these uh, kind of infrastructures are important. So there was a call 
for a fast track working group and the notion of fast track is very important in um, uh, health emergencies on different levels. There was a call and in about a week 600 members or new members uh, of the Research Data Alliance registered for the different uh, subgroups to work on this, uh, uh, producing these uh, recommendations and guidelines. Among them, there were uh, more than 160 that who were very active contributors to the documents that were produced. And they were experts in very different fields. The entire and multidisciplinarity was really was one of the characteristics of these uh, working groups. Uh, it worked through regular calls and uh, iterations of uh, documents. There were weekly webinars uh, and requests for comments for the release of the documents produced uh, from, uh, I think, 24 April to end of June. And the final release after all the uh, comments from communities and uh, the different steps within the RDA process for approving um, recommendations. Uh, so it came to a final release by the end of June. So in three months, a lot of work has been accomplished under the RDA guiding principles, which are openness, consensus, or reach for consensus, balance, harmonization, community driven, and non-profit and technology neutral. So no promotion of one tool rather than another one. This is just a, a quick slide to, to uh, underline that there was a strong organization of this working group to be efficient. Uh, these are all the co-chairs of this uh, working group and uh, uh, through the link indicated on the slide, you can have more information on the group uh, themselves. And uh, these co-chairs were uh, uh, steering the whole group and were distributed um, as a co-chair uh, attributed um, to different uh, subgroups, working groups, one specifically on clinical aspects and clinical data, one on the genomics and the different omics, uh, one on epidemiology, and you just heard how epidemiology is critical uh, and the data in epidemiology are critical for health emergencies uh, like um, a uh, pandemic, and social sciences. And there were also four uh, transversal uh, working groups uh, which were a community participation for data sharing, a rather big uh, uh, working group, uh, a specific group on indigenous data, and this is very critical for countries maybe like uh, um, uh, Brazil, uh, but Australia and uh, a number of uh, other countries, uh, even in the US, of course. Uh, there were a group on legal and ethical consideration. You just heard how important uh, this was uh, in all domains. And a more technical group on research software for data sharing in this uh, uh, context of uh, COVID-19. Each of those groups uh, had moderators, then you will hear, uh, after me, uh, two of the moderators of uh, some of those groups. So I'm not going to um, describe that. Uh, the moderators had a critical uh, role um, in uh, uh, producing uh, documents in these very specific uh, subgroups. And uh, the whole thing was um, very much helped uh, by an editorial team. Some of the uh, coaches were uh, part of the editorial team and they were really very helpful in producing a coherent uh, document, checking everything, all the links and so on. So after that, what did uh, this uh, group uh, produce? And this is the part on the outputs uh, that were produced. First of all, uh, best practice guidelines per subgroup and uh, general overall transversal. There were recommendations for researchers and policy makers. 
according to the aim of the group to help maximize data sharing. Uh, there, were, there was also a catalogue of key resources to inform these uh, guidelines. Uh, they could be uh, key data sets, standards, tools, repositories, references, and so on. And this is also available. And uh, then, and this is still ongoing, a visualization tool to facilitate the navigation of uh, such a rather complex and comprehensive uh, document according to the needs of different uh, stakeholders. So the document produced of this recommendation and guidelines is a 145 page document uh, with um, content, uh, as I just said, on, of uh, general, um, general and transversal aspects or uh, specific aspects per subgroup, clinical, epidemiological, and so on. There is an execu executive summary and there are supporting outputs, like the uh, as a Zotero library, all the references that are used uh, to produce the document with, throughout the document, or that have been used in the work of those uh, working groups. There are more specific uh, outputs, like an epidemiology document that has been endorsed by RDA, and there are a number of articles that are in preparation uh, right now after uh, all this uh, group. So I just uh, summarize, there are parts on the clinical aspects of the omics, epidemiology and social sciences, and then the transversal aspects on community participation, indigenous data, uh, research software and legal and ethical considerations. So what were the challenges we had to uh, go through uh, to produce this? And generally speaking, in this health emergency, uh, the need for rapid sharing of uh, research efforts, findings and data, and the necessity to balance uh, timeliness and uh, rapidity versus precision. Uh, there was generally a lack of pre-approved data sharing agreements. So how do you uh, manage in a world where there are no agreements on the international uh, level? There was no universal standard or system for uh, COVID-19 research outputs. And uh, we wanted to um, favor and uh, foster cross-disciplinary reusability for example, a number of clinical data are very useful to uh, uh, epidemiologists um, and so on. And uh, social scientists uh, have uh, data that they want also to use that are coming from uh, clinical um, records and so on. Uh, of course, there is uh, a lot of context in the different uh, um, context of um, produc production of data. Uh, like licensing, uh, documentation accompanying the data, and uh, ad hoc research software. So we had to play with all this in these different uh, subgroups. And this is just some of the recommendations. I, I don't intend in, uh, um, in a quarter of an hour to go through the whole document, uh, but uh, uh, this gives just some ideas of the general recommendations, like, for example, uh, the necessity to coordinate cross -juridic oh, <laughs> jurisdictional efforts to foster global open science through policy and investment. Remember that we are trying to address also policymakers. Uh, incentivize early publication and release of data. But at the same time, um, uh, to have quality data and to protect people. Um, if you go, for example, to the uh, number five recommendation, it's very important to have and uh, to require the use of data management plans. Uh, to, if you go to recommendation eight, I just pick some of them uh, here, uh, use trustworthy data repositories committed to the long-term preservation and sustained access to their data holdings. Um, the number 10, for example, is the necessity to balance ethics and privacy 
taking into account public interests and benefits while addressing the health crisis COVID-19. So this is the kind of um, recommendation to different stakeholders that have been produced uh, by these different working groups. Now I have a set of six slides well, I'm going just to jump over them. Uh, this one is giving some examples in each of the of group of the challenge uh, addressed, of the kind of um, uh, recommendation. Hello. Seems to be frozen. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, think we lost her video. Oh. And audio okay. also. Yeah. Um, let's um, let's do the following. Uh, can you just show? Uh, you have her slides, right? Can you just show them? And okay, I'm sorry, we just lost Anne. And for for time's sake. Uh, we will continue and then we'll go back to her so she can finish. This is not a very good solution, but while Anne, we are trying to get back to Anne, I would like to go on to the next speaker, which is Dao Wei Lin, who is a computational biologist who became data science official at Na the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH in the United States. And he plays a vital role in the division of allergy, immunology, and transplantation uh, at uh, this uh, institution in developing data strategies, execute them, and implement data science related programs. And he's one of the co-chairs of RDAWDS certification of digital repositories. And he's going to continue from what Anne was talking about to talk about the importance of trust in data sharing, but also something called the trust principles. So that way, thank you very much for coming to Brazil. <laughs> and uh, it's to you. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, let me share my screen. And uh, um, uh, so the um, I give a presentation. Yeah, I think uh, first I want to thank uh, Claudia's warm introduction and uh, your 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 uh, friendly personality that always makes things very easy and enjoyable. And I am also pleased to join uh, the discussions about the the concerns that we share globally. And, uh, but in my presentation, I want to uh, really drill down to a particular aspect of the open data, like what kind of open data is needed for fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is the, um, the trustworthy data. So to put the things into the perspective is that the open data really is for uh, open science. And, uh, and then on the bottom, that we need uh, the data to be fair in order for uh, the machines to easily analyze this data to extract the value. And, uh, and then in the middle, which, which I uh, highlight is the things that we all know, but sometimes we're not really talk enough about it, which is the, 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 the trustworthy of the data. And I will explain what the trustworthy means uh, and then what is the the trust principles, which is capitalized the trust. And uh, the I put the repository there uh, as a uh, placeholder for data providers, but but it can be uh, any other um, uh, organizations that, that will provide the data that, that the user can trust to use. You know, before they do some analysis, that, that trust relationship is very important. So, so why trust, what is a big issue here? And on the left of the slide, you can see uh, since the pandemic, the scientific world is very productive. Uh, in the middle, you can see there is, uh, there is 
37,000 papers has been published uh, like for the last six months. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, on the right indicate is not all of them that push us forward. And some are because of the data issues that have been retracted. And uh, a particular case I want to mention is that um, probably you all know that uh, the two, um, the prominent papers has been retracted uh, to study the uh, hydroxychloroquine. And the first box I highlight on the slide, uh, if you read uh, that is the, um, the two high profile papers after a company declined to make the underlying data for both available for an independent audit. So, so the data is not transparent and, and the authors just lose, just lost the trust to the data. And it doesn't matter how beautifully the analysis is done. It doesn't matter. So that is the reason that those, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the two papers are coming out offline, but, but they, it doesn't mean they diminish the damage. I think the second box, you can see that because of these papers, there's a whole like interruption of the clinical trials and there may be other things. I think that probably you all see a lot of uh, in the news. So you can see that you know the the fundamentally we have to have trustworthy data to push us forward, and uh, so the uh, just put the things in a little bit more easily understandable and understandable way. I think that in the middle is the data. Uh, we need some uh, uh, character characteristics to make the data usable. Uh, but also we need to know the context, you know, where are this data coming from? And is that data gonna stay there for a long time? As uh, Anne pointed out that, you know, like that we need some trustworthy repositories in order to let us to know the data we are dependent on are there, uh, we're gonna trust them. So, um, so then the, uh, this is trust uh, uh, is, uh, is for trust principles. And what is really in the ecosystem uh, that you heard about is that, uh, is the China, uh, is the, uh, try to have the management uh, that uh, the, uh, the process put in place to sometime convert the non-fair data, which is normally like we produce data is non-fair data and to fair data. And sometimes the fair data, I may, become unfair data, like non fair data again, because like there is standard change and it is not accessible anymore. It's not interoperable uh, anymore. And so the, if you have a trust in place, they can um, help the repositories that to uh, maintain what the user wants. And if user want open data, they gave them the open data. So, so this trust relationship is what uh, the trust principles are uh, is is talking about, and so here it is. So this is the um, the trust principles, and uh, this is the acronym, and uh, and the T for transparency, R for responsibility, and U for user focus, and uh, S for sustainability, and T for technology, uh, and the 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 this uh, slide shows a little bit. Uh, more information about what each letter means. Uh, like the, uh, I, I should mention that the order of those letters are also meaningful. For example, the transparencies is the foundation of trust. Uh, what the tra trans, uh, transparency talk about is that you have to uh, be specific about what the, your data is about or if you provide data, what the services that you're providing. And uh, you need to give people not only the promise, but also the evidence that people can verify that you are doing what you're doing. And uh, so that's the, uh, the foundation. And then the, uh, the responsibility is that uh, for the data providers that can, can they uh, do what they promised to do? And so that's, that's what the uh, responsibility about. And then user focus is the center of, of the whole ecosystem. 
And if the users that need to have open data, they give them open data. If you need a fair data, I need fair data. And then need to protect uh, the, the privacy as uh, Marcel mentioned uh, in her uh, in his talk, you give you protect the, the uh, pr privacy. And then the, uh, the uh, sustainability is that you want to do this for a long time. If the data is there for your, uh, for your, uh, uh, as the basis for your analysis, you want to come back uh, for after a while and to see if they're still true, like the, the things you find uh, that is still valid. And then the, uh, the technology is the, uh, is the infrastructure that you make sure that your service is in the secure environment, right? Is, is you maintain the, uh, the integrity and authenticity of the data you're collecting. So those principles are the ones that guide uh, or give the user of the data some sense of trustworthiness. And uh, so this trust principle is published uh, in May this year. Uh, I put the link uh, at the bottom and you can see, uh, you can read the paper for, for more details. And so the one aspect I wanna uh, mention is that the trust principle, although it is newly published, it has been working on for uh, a year and a half, but the, all the concepts is not new. Uh, so the, the, I put on the slides that like, you know, people can, like I've studied each aspect of the trust principle for a long time. And I, uh, the, the paper uh, in uh, nature scientific data actually have the references to the points I made on the slide. Like, you know, the, the trustworthy uh, is uh, connected with the transparency. And then the, um, also the, like, if you can define uh, your roles of responsibility, that can help that uh, to uh, make the data is, is you know, way that the focus on the user. And then the users like trust data is often uh, associated with the, the trust with the source of data, which is kind of increased credibility of the, all the research outcomes. And, uh, and then the, um, the sustainability is a important uh, issue. Like it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a foreign to the uh, biomedical world. And uh, we should say like there's still like 80% of the repositories died after the funding uh, ended. And that's a big issue that we should uh, address. And, uh, and then the technology, I, as you can imagine that there's, we're constantly attacked by the cyber, uh, cyber security attacks. And, uh, and then we should maintain that, uh, the infrastructure to support the, the data uh, that we use for, um, for life saving studies. And um, as you can see that, uh, so we, uh, we're really humbled by, uh, the endorsement from uh, different communities after that we um, published the trust principles and on the left there so far uh, there is like 27 organizations around the world has endorsed the trust the trust principle and then the trustworthy concept and then there's logos uh, on the left and then this list is still growing and i put the link uh to the bottom and you can uh, go through the uh RDA website uh, that to read more details about trust principles. And if you want to uh, endorse uh, the principles, you're you still uh, uh, welcome to do so. So uh, so I talk about this now, the, the trustworthy concept, and how do we use them? And uh, so I, uh, as one of the moderators for the, uh, the clinical subgroup, and, and this is an uh, uh, example I pick, uh, uh, picked from the, uh, the recommendations that, uh, that Anne mentioned uh, in her talk. And so this is the, uh, this is the, um, uh, is the recommendations that uh, for the, uh, the clinical data sharing. And I will not read the whole paragraph, but, but I, I think I wanna point out some challenge like, uh, like the, the, the clinical data sharing is of most important because many studies and trials are performed under enormous time pressure and with weakness in the method, methodology and the prior, preliminary result published with on any review. So for this type of environment, 
And the trustworthy data is even more important because you see that you know, once a paper published with the certain result implementation and the reaction to the communities can be day in days, they can suddenly change things. So we want the source of the data, uh, even it's preliminary, but it still needs to be trustworthy. And so uh, that's, the, um, that's the, the key words that we put into the recommendation that, um, that the, for uh, the data source, we want to be the trustworthy data source like the people will look into. And also the, uh, the second uh, one, that, the second box in the uh, middle, is that uh, uh, it's also uh, and point out in the, the number eight recommendations that uh, we should rely on as much as trustworthy data repository as possible for the, uh, the studies that we, uh, we're, we're going to uh, carry on. And so, um, so then the, uh, so what is the trust principles with all the uh, like the certifications, you know, like, you know, and also maybe you can ask, like, say, is that my repository is trustworthy or the, the repository that I use are trustworthy? I think that's all very good questions. Uh, I, sh I, sh I should, uh, like, gladly say, gladly say that the trust principles, uh, the one advantage of it is you already have implementations. So that the five Letters really gave you uh, or gave people who don't normally think about the the uh, the, the source of the data, easy handle to think about what kind of the data they need. But the implementation out there, for example, to uh, assess trustworthiness is that the the data um, the certification standards like Cultra Seal. Uh, so Cultra Seal is like peer reviewed standards, like the, you, you uh, rely on your repository peers to give you assessment, are you trustworthy or not? And then the ISO standard is the uh, uh, credential companies that there is professionals to go like spend the repository, spend, the, uh, spend like two or three days with the repository and to check out the process, are they trustworthy or not? And if they're, um, Past those uh, assessment, then they will have a seal or a, uh, a certification. But uh, that's not the only one, uh, only uh, ways to do it. And then uh, I think there's a lot of other uh, repositories that uh, demonstrate that the traits of the trust principle spe uh, spell out. That that's all the sources that, um, that you probably like to use. And so for the conclusion is that, um, is that the trust uh, is really gave you a mnemonic to easily mention or explain to people that what kind of you want is is very parallel to the fair data. It just like the the trust is on the data uh, provider level, and the the fair is on the data level, and uh, and also uh, uh, that uh, uh, I want to point out that the trust principle is is not a set in stone principle. It's just a starting. Uh, we just start like, you know, like the, the paper is like, you know, May this year is only like two and a half months. Uh, so we, we need uh, the community come together to help improve it. And as the guide uh, to, uh, to help us build a robust uh, data ecosystem. And, um, and that's, that's my presentation. Uh, I give the floor back to you, Claudia. Thank you, Doe. That was great and a great connection to our next speaker. Last but not least, Amy Pienta, who is a research scientist at the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research at the University of Michigan. And uh, among other things, she conducts research on retirement, disability behavior, and using secondary data from the Health and Retirement US Survey. And recently, she has been working on incentives to encourage scientists around open science and data sharing. And I give the floor to Amy, who's going to present. 
Thank you, Claudia. Such a nice introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm really excited to be going last because so much of the work of the background of um, what I'll be talking about today has been um, presented by by some of my colleagues. And so it's really nice that I can go and, um, and here's an example um, of what Dawei was just saying. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today um, is from the perspective of the social sciences. Um, the social sciences is a domain that has been vested in data sharing um, for decades. And, um, and so open data is a topic that um, social scientists have come by um, long ago as um, statistical agency data, uh, infrastructure was built for sharing, um, and much of that statistical agency data in our countries across the world um, uh, speaks to the heart of what social science research is all about. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about the social science data sharing experience, um, talk about my organization, ICPSR, which has a long history of sharing data as a trusted repository, um, and a little bit about how all the lessons that we've learned through the decades of um, running repositories that disseminate social science data can be leveraged to improve how um, COVID-19 data and pandemic data um, are accessed and used for the greater good. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to start with my, my first point, which is to talk a little bit about um, why social science uh, is at the table. It's a pandemic, it's about health, epidemiology is obviously important, but why social science? I don't think it's a hard leap to understand that um, the, make sure I just heard a bleep, make sure everyone can hear me. No one is trying to talk to me. Yes, we are hearing you fine and wonderfully. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for that reassurance. I heard a, I heard a beep. And so I thought, where is that coming from? Um, okay, so headlines in the news. Um, mo as much as this is um, a, a health crisis, this is a social and economic and political crisis worldwide. The headlines that you see here um, just on any given day are as much about um, schools and, and learning for children, about living alone, <laughs> about loneliness, about homelessness, about the impact on institutionalized populations in prisons, and so on, about dating, the new rules of dating in the time of COVID. Um, so everything about the social world has changed and everything about how we are successful or not su successful at um, understanding the impact of the disease on the population um, ties to these, to these broader issues. Um, so, so much more than a health and medical crisis, um, social scientists are um, collecting data and providing data that help answer questions such as these about um, the impact of staying at home as we isolate or in many countries as we fail to social distance ourselves from others or follow guidelines about masks, um, about the closing of schools and movement to virtual learning and who that impacts, um, about working from home or inability to work because one's job um, has been uh, furloughed. Uh, the changes in our community as small businesses uh, are shuttering and even large corporations around us are failing. That changes the character of the places where we live um, and impact on, um, as I said in the last slide, institutionalized populations of COVID-19 um, as um, the pandemic affects disproportionately people living in that kind of situation. And then because of um, uh, the importance of social and economic order in all the places we live, how there are vastly growing inequalities and disparities, not just of the health impact, but the impact of all these other changes on the population. Um, and so for uh, groups that were already uh, behind in, in school and educational outcomes, the pandemic just um, is poised to make even greater impact there as well. 
Uh, so repositories, as I mentioned in my introductory slide, uh, in the social scientists have actually been around for a long time. And my organization is much like um, many of the others in the sense that it was um, a, a repository to share social science data that was founded in 1962. So um, over 55 years of experience um, taking scientific data um, and making sure that it was accessible for the broader good. So ICPSR itself is one of the oldest and largest social science data archives. One of the things that sets it apart from other uh, countries in the US, the situation is such that um, our repository um, environment in the US in these at this early time in the 1960s um, was not um, funded by uh, the federal government. And so ICPSR is a uh, hybrid model. And I think it actually benefits from that in the sense that it, it is a membership and subscription service where um, institutions around the US, academic institutions and other kinds of organizations that care about data in the US and also um, institutions around the world contribute to ICPSR to um, um, perform its mission of preserving as much social science data and making it accessible in a fair way um, to the broad community around the world. Uh, but it also, um, it does not have that hard line of funding as being uh, the, the, the official distribution arm of a statistical agency like the census. We do engage with federal agencies uh, to do work on their behalf, but it's um, on a grant and contract basis and, um, and not sort of a hard line budget. And so it is um, different in that sense from European archives, for example, uh, in the social sciences, um, which have a dedicated mission often to uh, distributing the social science data from statistical agencies. Um, so Dawei did a really good job of talking about um, uh, the ways that we know that repositories um, are going to do right by the data and do right by the data, not for today, but into the long future. And so um, it's no surprise that um, ICPSR um, in its long history of having developed its policies and procedures is a core trust seal certified uh, repository um, with other awards and, and medals recently as well. Um, so this is the part where I talk about the great success that all the decades of investment that our organization has made in preserving and making accessible data has had on changing the nature of um, social science itself, because we've really amassed a large collection of data from uh, that are relevant to social science research and anyone else who does research that needs social science data. Um, with over 14,000 studies, most of these studies are curated and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more on the next slide because it's essential I think to the open science, to open data topic um, to differentiate between uh, curated data and not curated data. Um, and of these 14,000 studies that we're disseminating, over 1,500 of them have sensitive and confidential information, and the data have to be managed in very careful ways. And so we have really robust ways of doing that. Um, related to the data collections, we maintain all of the um, outputs, the publications related to the data um, in a searchable um, database. Um, and also uh, long ago in our history, we recognized that making data available without training the generation of scientists to be good users and consumers of that data, to have appropriate methods to analyze the data would be uh, less impactful. Uh, we've run a really long um, and um, uh, sustained summer training program, bringing, bringing uh, junior scholars and graduate students and uh, people um, um, re-upping their statistical techniques in our summer training program. And so many people throughout the world visit ICPSR um, each summer uh, to learn about the latest statistical methods for analyzing data. Um, of course, it's a virtual program this summer. Um, and so let me move on. So the things that make um, data really open. So ICPSR, because it serves one domain, it's a broad domain, the social sciences, um, can really understand and make available the data in a way that the data are really well care for, cared for. 
it is highly curated data from ICPSR versus other places that are simply DOI mentors and um, a place to simply store and access data. Um, so we have a really rich set of metadata, structured metadata that makes that machine actionable data that we've talked about already earlier in this presentation and documentation to ensure that the data are used and usable, again, not just today, but in 10 or 20 years when there's no one left to ask about the data, not perhaps because they died, but because they've moved on to other projects and would be morbid. Um, all of this data, the curation workflow of ICPSR, our attention to metadata and the standards around making sure the metadata are usable means that we also have um, high discoverability and accessibility of the collections that we hold. Um, the data itself are available in many data formats um, so that it's um, more neutral in terms of stat packages needed to analyze any of our data sets. So all of that work is done for the user. So that's the real sort of like selling point of a domain repository that's been around for a long time and its impact that it can has it has on making data available, a very large mass collection. But in and of itself, um, despite our pride over the success of um, the state of um, serving the social sciences broadly and in the US, um, we did a, a survey at ICPSR of all of the social science data, social and behavioral science data um, funded by two of the big um, institutions in the US by NIH and by NSF, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And when we did a survey um, of um, all of the uh, historic grantees that have collected social science data, what we found is that despite the investment and the availability of places like ICPSR in the US, less than 15% of social science data was archived. Um, when we did our study. And I'm not, it's certainly changing, uh, but it's still a situation that despite robust repository resources, people will not necessarily use them. And this is where I'm going to shift for uh, the, the next portion of my talk. This is what I work on most at ICPSR. Um, this is about um, making sure that the services that we have are aligned to making it easy, for researchers to share their data, answering the concerns that they have, um, and getting them to use the resources and benefit from using those resources. Um, so researchers really are reluctant to share their data. Um, often uh, we reach out and we ask people about data um, and we hear these sort of set of concerns. The number one thing that's mentioned is being concerned that the data have confidentiality risks. How do we keep private information from our study participants? It was promised in the informed consent, so all really important. There are also concerns that researchers have about getting scooped. They put a lot of investment into the data and obviously remain concerned um, about what they want to accomplish with the data and opening the doors to the data threatens um, potentially um, the impact that they themselves will mine from the data for their own career. Concerns about errors in the data and documentation. This one is really not trivial. Um, researchers um, always hold on to data because they want to improve it further, um, add more documentation, add more information. And so, um, helping researchers here is critical in terms of making sure that um, they have the comfort level and, and, and good guidance on how to, and the best practice for how to uh, manage their data in ways that make the, um, they address this question of um, sharing data um, if it's not up to sort of the quality of sharing. So getting the data to the point where it is of sufficient quality. Um, and then always uh, the final one that we hear most often is having limited resources for preparing the data and the documentation. And this really speaks squarely to um, limited resources and funding agencies themselves as they fund research. Um, it's not always possible to recognize the enormous costs of data management and, um, and the data curation and sharing process itself. 
Um, so, but there are things that repositories are doing um, to make sure data are open despite these kinds of concerns. Um, so one, not all data has to be available for direct download. Um, there are many good ways to handle restricted use data. Um, at ICPSR, my institution, um, we have, like I said, over 1,500 studies that contain um, indirect identifiers or sensitive data or both. Um, and we use data use agreements or which um, bind institutions and users of the data um, to following um, the protocol for accessing the data and for having a data security plan approved to keep the data safe um, at their institution. Um, it's also possible for users of many of our restricted data sets um, with a data use agreement to gain access to data, but in our own virtual data enclave, which means we don't send the data to their secure environment. We keep the data at the University of Michigan and allow users to connect into the data securely. Um, so all of these ways are governed by both the, the legal document that institutions and individuals sign with the University of Michigan and ICPSR and security controls um, that are either described to us or enforced because um, they're off offered and operated on our servers. Um, so the, the, I want to talk about a couple of these other um, concerns that we see when it comes I'm to I'm so open, sorry yes. to interrupt you, but you're just over time limit. So if you don't ah. mind uh, going very fast from now on, thank you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Speeding up. I do not have too much more, Claudia, no problem. Um, some of the, um, uh, the data when they are in use um, actively um, are always better for, for sharing, sharing data earlier rather than later and simply embargoing the data to release at a future date is a really popular method for repositories. Um, addressing the concern of what about the data not being ready to be shared, obviously data management practices are important. Um, there are so many guidelines out there to assist researchers in preparing data for sharing. The RDA guidelines that Anne um, so well described and talked about are um, a really good starting point to both um, understand best practices in data management and also to leap off into our bibliography, our Zotero bibliography of lots of other resources that researchers can use to prepare data uh, to ensure that they are efficiently and effectively shared. Um, our approach at ICPSR besides um, publishing um, guidelines and reports is to um, offer curation services ourselves where we are doing the resolving and cleaning and standardization and documentation of the data from what the researcher provides to us. Um, and this is a list of the kinds of um, curatorial activities that a domain repository like ICPSR takes to ensure data use. Um, to be sure that um, researchers themselves are getting credit, this has, um, has to be said, uh, data need to be cited well um, and in a standard way and with a DOI, a persistent identifier, so that researchers get credit and all the different various outputs that get produced to the data can be linked back to that original um, data collection point. Um, so this is an example of a data citation that makes this possible. Um, as well, um, looking at the impact of any single data set, this is the National Survey of Black Americans. You can see that it's been downloaded over 2,000 times. Um, this is uh, the reference period is in the past three years. Um, and so tracking the impact of data becomes important um, to understanding what the data themselves have contributed, but also that original research team that collected the data. Um, so last two slides, Claudia. Um, so Taking all of the experience um, that I've talked about, ICPSR, um, like many others, have um, committed to making COVID-19 data um, more accessible um, in our sphere. Uh, we have um, an open ICPSR COVID data repository. Um, and our approach to COVID-19 data is focusing on um, making it easy for the researcher uh, to make their data available. So an easy interface, easy to upload the data um, and speed of access. So data are self-published and um, immediately available. Um, it gets the DOI and that persistent identifier. But the other piece of this that I really did want to emphasize is that um, the curation process still should happen where it can um, to make sure that those data 
um, where there are gaps in the documentation or inconsistencies in the data that they're caught, fixed, improved, um, so that um, COVID-19 resource is ready quickly, but then um, improved to a point where um, it becomes a permanent and valuable resource um, for the long future as well. Um, our repository has 15 studies, um, and I will say that we have um, taken on a massive effort to identify social science data um, to add to the COVID-19 repository. There's over 400 um, studies listed in the social sciences that we are actively approaching to add their data to our COVID-19 repository. So I think it just speaks to the volume um, of research that is going on. Um, so with that, Claudia, I will turn it back to you and stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, let me, okay, thank you so much for, uh, you know, presenting this wonderful talk. And now, since Anne Cambon Thompson is back with us, she came back all the way from France, and um, please, um, just wrap up with your final thoughts in at most two minutes. Thank you so much. I'm passing on to you. Please turn your phone and camera on and uh, go. I cannot turn my camera on. Only you can, I think. But uh, I'm there. Um, first of all, uh, I'm sorry that I uh, um, I became uh, a ghost, not only virtual, but a complete ghost, and I did not realize. Uh, so sorry for that. And uh, uh, what I want to, to um, uh, do now is just to uh, underline some of the elements that I could not uh, uh, show uh, when I, I was cut. Um, an important thing uh, after describing the the content of the document produced is how to use the document because it's a 145 page document um, uh, addressed to many different people. So no one is going to have the use of the full document. It's not like um, a book that you read. Uh, so there, are, there is a specific uh, group still working on uh, different tools uh, to make it possible to find, and that's the challenge, uh, within 10 minutes exactly what you need in this big document. Uh, so there will be an infographics, which is ready, a mind map, and a wizard uh, uh, adapted to the different uh, groups uh, and questions that you can have. Uh, it's important to foster the impact because recommendations and guidelines that are not implemented are completely non-useful. Uh, so the dissemination to communities, and that's part of what we are doing today, um, and institutions is uh, essential. And we do hope that these recommendations and guidelines are broad enough to be of interest for very numerous stakeholders uh, across uh, the world. Um, I will just uh, highlight to finish and to wrap up some of the general policies that uh, have been underlined in the document. Uh, first of all, promote fair sharing, so the fair principles uh, of COVID-19 related data. Second, encourage expedited review processes for pandemic related research and Dawei has uh, alluded to, to that encourage researchers to apply generic metadata for COVID-19 related data. And uh, I think um, all the other speakers have uh, talked about the importance of the metadata. Uh, request authors, and this is for publishers and uh, editors, to add available contextual documentation, promote the use of trustworthy repositories, said that way he said everything that was needed on that. And of course, respect the ground rules for ethics, privacy, and sound legal uh, frameworks for data sharing in COVID-19. So I can say that the take home messages will be data availability is uh, in time of a pandemic is a priority, a high priority. A variety of well-documented data is needed, not just numbers and of cases and deaths and good metadata. Uh, the RDA guidelines uh, 
uh, are meant to increase data sharing and especially regarding standards and the trustworthy data sources. Uh, these recommendations are in principle applicable in a broad uh, geographical coverage, not just in one country or another. And interdisciplinarity, which is highly needed, um, referring to community uh, uh, and the standards was uh, chosen. Uh, so we addressed uh, general aspects, even if they were already known in a given community, uh, because other communities are in the need and do not necessarily know what is obvious for some in a given community. So that's my take home messages. And in relation to what Ami was just uh, uh, mentioning, I would like to say that uh, I, I told you that there are many uh, working and interest groups in RDA. And one that I am co chairing, not related to COVID 19 specifically, uh, is called Shark Sharing Rewards and Credit and Address. Uh, the issues of recognizing in specifically in the academic uh, evaluation of uh, people and of the work, uh, all the steps that are needed to share data and not only the classical um, uh, publication of results and so on. So this is very much in related with what uh, Ami was presented. That's why I wanted to mention that. So shark is uh, an easy uh, something you can easily remember. So that was, uh, thank you very much, Claudia, for giving me the opportunity to uh, not um, uh, finishing the talk like a ghost, but as a, a real, even if virtual person. Thank you very much. For thank you, Anne. Muito obrigada. Obrigada. That's very good for to pronounce. Uh, thank you. Um, and now I'd like to ask all of the panelists to turn their cameras and microphones on so that we have lots of questions um, and many are directed to specific people, but I'll first pose the questions uh, that can be answered by all of you. Okay, so Mauricio, Dalway, Amy, can you please turn your cameras on even though you may want to keep your microphones off okay so uh the first uh, Bobby, I did, like uh we don't have a central okay oh i'm so sorry um someone need to authorize it as to appear oh okay yeah. there you yeah. are you've yeah. been authorized <laughs> good that's a, i am not that's, yet yeah okay. that that was a trusted connection okay <laughs> so uh let's um ask while people are connecting mauricio to us let's go to the first question that was asked by ayana martins so as the number of variables increase there is a, a, of what is going to be studied and published the uh, risk of re-identification increases how do you deal with that? The question was to Mauricio, but afterwards I'd like all of you to comment a little bit on that, given that all of you have experience with big uh, data repositories. There, Mauricio. Yeah, this is a, is, is a big problem uh, because uh, in the beginning, uh, years ago, people uh, uh, believe that if you take out some identifiers, uh, important identifiers, you uh, the, this database will, will not be identified again. But uh, the, the same methods uh, that are used for in data science in general, uh, they are also using uh, artificial intelligence techniques. And uh, they, they have been used a lot for identification process. Mm -hmm. uh, then as far as you put together né, different data from one individual, né, the chance or the possibility that you're using these intelligent tools and you had you identified this person is a, is a, is a real, né, is a fact. Then I think this is a big question, yeah, when using this data. Né? For example, as in CDAX, né, you have a, a, a position 
that not even they, they identify databases go out from CEDAX. Yeah, the, all the analysis uh, of the identified databases are done inside CEDAX, yeah? And with uh, a lot of safety rules, yeah? The, not only the, the, the researcher sign, yeah? A lot of uh, agreements and a lot of documents, yeah? and uh, having the, the approvals, ethical approvals, yeah, to use the database, but the database is inside CEDAX, and right? they are not downloadable, yeah, they, they, they can access the database through VPN, for example, yeah, okay, the, the identify data is in a separate setting, yeah, but when a, a, a database for research is extracted, yeah, they identified, they go to another environment, and this environment, the, the data there is not downloadable, yeah, is, is the last minute, yeah, that you, you have. And the curator services in CDAX, yeah, they negotiate with the research to take out as many as possible, yeah, potential identifier, right? You are using some parameters, yeah, of risk assessment, yeah, for identification, yeah? There is now some criteria uh, of a risk assessment that you can balance, yeah, how risky is a, a identification, then you take out as much as possible, yeah, identifiers or variables that can be identified. But this is a major problem, it's an area of research, a lot of it, Computing people's uh, computing security, yeah, is a is a central research area nowadays, yeah, to try to develop a mechanism of data protection, yeah, as much as possible. Then this is a not is unsolved issue, yeah, and I think the repositories, yeah, need to put some, yeah, safeguards, yeah, some protection, yeah. Steps, yeah, as much as possible to protect the chance of identification. Yeah? But it's not, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a question, yeah. Thank you. Now, who wants to complement with their experience uh, and the way, Amy? And so, and go okay, ahead. Uh, uh, what I want to say is that there are the technical. Uh, tools you can use, like Mauricio was uh, alluding to. Uh, there are also uh, more on the uh, ethical and institutional aspect. Um, uh, the fact that, first of all, when you ask for a consent, you have to be very careful not to promise something that you cannot hold. That is, if you promise anonymity, and uh, we know that more and more uh, re-identification can become uh, uh, possible. Uh, so it has to be formulated in such a way that you protect the uh, anonymity as much as possible, but not engage. And this is for all the reduction uh, preparation of content forms. The other thing is institutional responsibility. Usually researchers using data or using data from different databases um, uh, have an institutional uh, attachment. Uh, so there, this institution can ask uh, and require their researchers uh, if, in case of re-identification, if this happened, not to use that because it's not the fact of re-identifying itself that can be the problem, but how you use the fact of re-identifying somebody. So there are different tools, the technical ones and the institutional ones, and also be careful not to promise in the ethical aspects, things that you cannot uh, really be sure to accomplish. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, Amy. Yeah. And to add to what, to what Anne was saying, to make it memorable, a lot of the repositories follow a five safes framework, five safes. So you can have safe projects that make sure that the use of the data is appropriate for the data, that uh, we have safe people. Can the users be trusted to use the data in appropriate manner? Uh, safe settings, uh, which means that uh, the data can be accessed um, from a facility that provides safety measures. Um, is the data safe, which means that we can, no matter what, apply 
disclosure risk mitigation to the data um, and safe outputs that um, using any or all of these other things, um, we can make sure that the output from the data um, is not disclosive. So with the proliferation of variables and data and information about people, um, we have to use one or many of these five safes to keep information safe and protected. And I will say that the five safes framework um, is in the RDA guidelines. Thank you, that way. So I, I think I, uh, I will pass, I think the, the previous comment. Okay, so I'll direct the next question to you, <laughs> but then, uh, because it was directed to you, and it's from Marianne, um, Louis, I'm sorry, Marianne, I don't know how to pronounce your surname. So, what is uh, the most effective way to keep repositories alive? And uh, maybe you can uh, use NCBI as an example. Yeah, no, that's a very, uh, very good question. Uh, I, I, th I think the uh, to keep your repository alive uh, is really is about keeping your user happy. And if, if you are keeping yourself relevant to the community and the community will support you like one way or another. And like, you know, either like say, for, I, I think as, as uh, Amy pointed out, like uh, as, uh, well, ICPSR is not funded by federal government, it's from the community. So I think it is, uh, has to address a, a very specific need and also follow that need over time because the technology change, user the needs change, and the repository have to adjust themselves. And uh, and once that key element is falling, uh, uh, keep it down, and then you can look for um, how you do the things efficiently, right? How do is like cheaply? That that's gonna come to the technology part, and uh, and come to the if you have a uh, sustainability plan, for example, how you mitigate your risk, how do you anticipate that your funding will go away? Are you, how can you still uh, survive? So those are the, um, a few thoughts that uh, to, to, uh, for the comments. Um, any other comments on how to keep people happy, users happy, of course, not people, and repositories alive? No, so well. Uh, so, um, Amy, talking about keeping users and repositories alive, there's a, a question from uh, Francis Crawley. Uh, who's the coordinator of the European Fellowship in Research Ethics. And um, he wants to know if the ICSPR data is open to all scientists and is it part of open science or do people have to pay to get them? Most of our collection is open and free to everybody. We have grants and contracts with various agencies. Uh, we run a repository for the National Institute on Aging, for drug abuse, for NICHD, and so on and so forth. All of those collections, uh, because the work of, on the data, the curation of the data has been funded are open and free. Uh, for things that come into ICPSR that are um, part of um, the general uh, purpose bucket of ICPSR and funded by our membership and subscription fees, um, those are available for free to members um, and others pay $550 to access a study in a year. So not bad. Your microphone. Wow, oh, you're mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and um, I just like to reassure all the people who are sending questions that your questions will be answered afterwards um, via email, even if I don't manage to ask them all. Okay, so um, in fact, there is another uh, question from, from Francis Crawley to uh, Dawe, but it applies to all of you. Um, do act actually, the, what is, uh, just a second. Why do you think there is so little access 
or success, sorry, and actually sharing data during the COVID-19 uh, period. Mm, okay, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, I think um, there, there oh, are some- I'm sorry, there is a continuation. Uh, do you think trust principles or any ethical principles, um, one would want to describe underlie the problem? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, I just want to mention, I think, uh, and already gave out some reasons that uh, sometimes like other researchers that are reluctant to share data. Uh, and I think Annie mentioned about that too. But I think in the COVID-19, um, uh, there is a special uh, scenarios we didn't really anticipate, uh, anticipate that like the, the people who have data are busy with their work. Like in the physicians doing the clinical trials they're saving lives, you know, like the, it's, it's hard for them to say, oh, you know, I need to share data for people to reuse. So, um, so the, that's kind of another uh, reason that I, uh, I, I didn't know before. And then, but I think people are thinking about uh, innovative ways to address that. Like say, for example, uh, they have this uh, called the data sniffer, like they go to the clinical setting and just sniff the data, like while the other people are still doing the job, and then put that data out in the in the sense that um, it is making the timely sharing. So, so that's one point I want to add. Okay. Any other thoughts, Mauricio? Yeah, I think uh, because it, uh, Claudia, I think there is two different problems. Eh? One is research data, eh? data that are collected for research. And the guy, the, the, the person, uh, the individual give you a, a clear, uh, uh, informed consent, yeah? And there is the data that they are routinely collected, yeah? Uh, surveillance data, hospital-based data, yeah? There are two types of data that are used, yeah? For example, the FAPSP uh, repository is a hospital-based database. It's not a research yeah, data or data collected which the, the main purpose of research. Then I, first it is two type of data. Né? And also I think it needed to, to solve all the problems linked with this data. A lot of the efforts have been around the research data. Yeah, that the data from trials, from a specific study. But for example, when you look for data from surveillance, yeah, data that are collected routinely yeah, by the health system, uh, other completely database yeah, or, or other complete rules yeah, that uh, influence this connection. I think there is a, a need to put this debate together. Yeah? I think there is a, a bias in this discussion because great part of the discussion are, <clears throat> are by founder agents. Né? And the founder agents are, are more concerned with the data collected for research. Yeah? They are not surveillance data, yeah. But but when you see an epidemic like this one, the great part of the data necessary to solve problem, to modeling, to a lot of surveillance data are not data for research, yeah. A data for research is sure is important, yeah. But it is not the first kind of data that are central. I think this this for me is a problem that is, is not yet solved. Yeah, I, maybe Anne Campbell can 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 give some comments on RDA how RDA see that. Yeah, but in my view as a researcher here in Brazil, yeah, I see that this is a problem that needed to be tackled. Yeah, in this. Uh, international discussion. Then I think that because they need the different frames, yeah, to to, to circulate the data, né? and this is not set up yet clearly. Then when you have a pandemic, all the time that you have a pandemic, there is a pandemic of people not thinking on data, yeah, but they don't solve the problem before, yeah, the legal statement, the ethical. Yeah, need some ethical standardization. A lot of things need to be done. I think there is a lot of organization now working on that. But when the pandemic came, yeah, Zika, for example, was I remember there was a lot of discussion data and it came again on, on SARS in the past and now in the in the COVID-19, yeah, this came back, come back again. Yeah? And all the time you are not sufficiently prepared. Yeah, mm -hmm. to tackle the, the complexity, all the complexity 
of the uh, data circulation, yeah, with some thing. And there is another thing is, is the owner of the data. No? The, the data are collected by people if it's a research data or by government, yeah, if it's surveillance data. Then uh, how the ownership are understandable, yeah, are interpreted by each one is also a big problem, yeah, because it, need yeah the owner owner or the the the, the responsible for the data give nah, permission to the data to be used i think it uh, need a lot of preparation and work that I, I i i know that there is a lot of efforts done but i i, I in my views yet incomplete yeah and when you have a crisis like this yeah you see how yeah you have uh, you are insufficiently yeah, prepared to 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 deal with the the data question in a in an emergency like the COVID nineteen pandemic. Well. Thank you. Since he mentioned you UN, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I, afterwards, I, think that I, I can I can add uh, something, and you just addressed me, Mauricio. Um, I think that uh, uh, that way could also. Um, mentioned that in the clinical subgroup in the RDA uh, working group COVID-19, uh, we had this discussion about uh, clinical data and uh, clinical trial data. So clinical trial are clearly coming with a research uh, environment uh, in the clinical environment. Uh, and clinical um, data, uh, when you observe, uh, take care of uh, cases and so on, a lot of uh, data are created there. So the heterogeneity of the sources of the data, uh, obeying to different uh, frameworks, uh, were, I think, one of the sources of the difficulty. And um, at least for the uh, European uh, Union, uh, there is uh, a group of uh, scientific advisors to the Commission, there is uh, the European Group on Ethics, and uh, these two groups are uh, working together uh, to uh, analyze the difficulties that have been encountered uh, in order to be better prepared, at least at the European uh, level, for next time, and having on the agenda being prepared for a proper sharing of useful data uh, is uh, probably something that was not anticipated enough before and one of the lessons that can be learned uh, from uh, the experience. So we can hope that uh, this will be addressed in practice using the RDA or others uh, guidelines on, on that. But, uh, you know, the standards are different. The reference yeah. uh, are different. The legal frameworks are uh, different, different for clinical data and research data, for example. Um, and that is one of the, one of the reasons why uh, it was uh, much more this kind of difficulties uh, than the non-willingness of researchers to share because of uh, many, many things. There was a real willingness to share, I think, in um, COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, but a lot of difficulties that were not anticipated enough before. So being prepared is, I think, the lesson to be learned. And of course, this pandemic is teaching us how to be prepared, right? So yeah. Dalway and Amy, would you like to expand or add? I just wanted to put a, a human face on this question, Claudia. Um, under the best of circumstances, sharing data is really time consuming and hard. And, um, and scientists are often struggling to do it. Obviously in this time of the pandemic, um, it is even harder and time is even more limited. I think most of us know the face of uh, the, 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 the papers that are coming out that say that female scientists who make up more than half of the science workforce um, cannot keep their publication workflows going while they are working from home and caring for children and running virtual schools. Um, and so when you think about sort of like what scientists themselves have going on behind the scenes, it adds yet another element of complexity to um, the kind of attention that, that the scientists and their teams are going to have for putting data out there. That said, I think Anne made that really great last point that, um, Anecdotally, I would say we can endorse um, from my organization, which is that people are want to be good scientists, citizens of sci citizens more than ever, and share their data. Um, 
whether they have time to, or whether the, it's easy enough to do, or whether we have the right um, help to help them. Um, that's our job <laughs> in our communities, um, but, um, but it's hard. So uh, Claudia, I just want to add uh, a perspective from fun funding agencies. Uh, since the NIH are fund the majority of the, uh, the medical research. And I think for the COVID-19 specifically, that uh, when they get the COVID-19 research, they have to provide the data sharing uh, policy and uh, the plans. And also that uh, they now also can request the supplements that if they need extra help, the technical help or personal help, they can request additional money in order to help them uh, share the data. And, and there's a couple of the funding opportunities out there specifically for, for that purpose. Thank you. Um, I think maybe uh, um, we should uh, stop here because of time constraints. But before we finish, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for this very exciting uh, ping pong of uh, question answering and even with a ghost coming and appearing uh, and I'd like to ask each of you to say a few final words to our audience and to scientists who will certainly want to contact you because we'll provide them with contact information and slides okay uh, maybe by the order in which you started Mauricio yeah, I think my conclusion is that uh, uh, I think the, the, the question of data need to take to take, to be taken more seriously. Yeah, to, to because all the time that you have a pandemic you know, or an epidemic, yeah, people are more concerned. But I think this is part of science of modern science nowadays. Yeah? And then I think it need to be taken more serious. Yeah, in, in different bodies, in different groups, in different scientific communities. Yeah, to to solve the problem. And now I'd like to say that, for example, despite the, the research data have some regulation to, to share. Yeah, for example, all the, all the problem around the papers, the, the famous yeah, papers that was withdrawn yeah, of the, 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 that data, that data was not research data, that data was hospital-based data. Yeah, that uh, 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 is, is, a, is a very clear question, yeah, very clear point yeah to us why that data was uh, illegally yeah assembled or or, or or maybe don't know maybe it's a fake data yeah because someone created or make fake data that it would be very easy i was looking down this question eh, and say why my god why a big journal two big journals yeah new england and lancet yeah peer reviews technical boards looking for a data from 500 hospital around the world and don't you ask who authorized a small company in united states to use the data for 500 different hospital all over the world because no one uh, they, 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 some of the guys are from harvard university harvard don't check this yeah don't you have any structure i know that harvard have a legal uh, department to check the data that enter in the in the, in the system because what's happened i think is a very good case yeah to ask you to think about yeah, the, how the flow of data can exist in a legal basis, can be quick because they are very, very much useful. Yeah, because that paper, if it was true, yeah, can they answer the answer a question that everyone was asked about, yeah, the effect of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine on health, yeah. And by some way, the guy or some company yeah, create yeah, this data or make a fake data or falsified, no one knows clearly what's happened. Yeah? Then I think it's a very good question for us to start a point here, yeah, the how to make it free use, but what responsibility, yeah, which legal frame, which ethical, yeah, Associated because this data is very much important. Yeah, it's not only clinical data or research data. I think the routine collect data, be clinical or public health. I, I don't call public health or clinical data only because it, some are public health data. Nah? And I, uh, I think this is necessary. Uh, uh, continuous discussion. Yeah. Uh, on the different communities. Yeah. The research community, research organization. Yeah 
to uh, use this data more routinely, yeah, not only on on, on epidemic period. I think it's a it's a need, yeah, for for the growth at least of the health research is a very necessary step, yeah, to use international big large data set, yeah, to make our findings more generalizable, yeah. That is my final thought. Thank you very much. For Thank you. But you are going to stay a little bit afterwards, right? Yes, for, yes, so we yes, can yes talk. I know. <laughs> um, uh, and to you, please. Yes, so my final words would be in the line of what Mauricio said, the importance of data and the uh, importance of being or conceiving the data with the aim of sharing from the start. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, be it research data, be it clinical data, this idea of sharing for some part with some regulation, uh, everything around, of course, um, has to be there. So data primarily would have to be thought of in terms of sharing, not just achieving my own um, aims. Mm -hmm. And I think this is uh, true, and if this culture um, become more widely shared with all the security around, and it's not um, opening the data with a danger for the people. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the spirit of uh, why do we create data uh, and the sharing being always one of the aims uh, would be a change of culture. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you need all the practical aspect, uh, help to share and all this. But the first thing is, why do we produce data if we don't share them? Mm -hmm. That would Thank be my you. conclusion. Thank you. Dawei. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I mean, we are dealing a pandemic and, and this virus really kind of attack all of us. So to address this type of challenge, I think we need a community approach. And, uh, and I think the, uh, I was very inspired by the RDA, put all these kind of people together to give all these guidelines and recommendations uh, to help people make connections. And the data is a commodity that the, you're more connected, you more use it and the more value they has. And I think they, um, uh, what I want to uh, uh, encourage, I think that we uh, work on uh, the trust principles at the community approach to, to make the data trustworthy. And I think I want to uh, welcome people join us or find the ones that you can uh, initiate a community efforts that will benefit the whole community. Thank you. And last but not least, Amy. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I guess I'd leave with um, my final words being about um, coming from one of the longest lived scientific data archives in the world. Um, we've, we've seen a lot, we've experienced a lot, we have a lot of answers for some of the questions that others are dealing with. If you are a repository looking to um, establish policies and protocols, we are happy to talk to you. If you are a researcher collecting data, not knowing what to do with your data, uh, we are happy to talk to you and direct you to places um, in your domain or in your part of the world um, uh, to help make sure that your data are open and accessible. Um, and, uh, and if you're at a funding agency thinking about um, how to ensure open data policies, um, again, we are happy to help. Um, Claudia, thank you for inviting me as well. Oh, um, it was very exciting. And I'm sure everybody who's listening in or who look at this uh, YouTube will love hearing not only about COVID data, which was the motivation, uh, but also about all the data problems underlying science and how science can be advanced by sharing data. I'm going to close now with a few words. First of all, uh, all of you uh, who want to know more about FAPESP's repository, which has been mentioned by Mauricio, uh, but also by myself, please look at covid19.fapesp.com br or have pointers to projects data sources and our repositories second 
though I have thanked our speakers, I thank them again once more for this very interesting and exciting discussion. And last but not least, I'd like to stress that as all such efforts as this webinar, there's lots of people working behind the scenes. And now I'm going off script and I'm going to, and, and I need a paper, so I won't forget anyone. So I will, my face will be erased right now because I have to read, right? So first of all, I'd like to thank the editorial board that is coordinating the series of seminars. Maria Alfonso Luis, Marta Hesch, Euclides Mesquita, Cristóvão Albuquerque, and Catarina Porto. And I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. And behind the scenes, Ana Paula Yokozawa and a huge team of people, including Roberta Meletti, Vera Filippi, Gabriela, and please forgive me if I have forgotten someone. So thank you to all of you and thanks to our audience. And if you have any more questions, you can send them and they will be answered by our speakers. And now 